Uh, welcome, everyone. The first panel today is on global justice and redistribution. Uh, we have two presenters, Christian Berry, a philosopher at Australian National University, and uh, Glenn Weil here uh, in economics at the University of Chicago. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you are, giving, uh, you are presenting distinct research projects, but you're giving a joint presentation. Yes. Is that correct? OK. All right, great. Uh, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it over to you now. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much. Yeah, so as Sankar just said, and thanks so much, yeah. Sankar, yeah. Um, this uh, presentation will interweave a conversation between me and Christian, hopefully. Uh, and before I get started uh, on my part, I just wanted to uh, thank uh, two people uh, who are here and one person who's not here. Uh, Adam Godby and Ju was Julian Manasa Boatani, who, uh, and Michelle Jang, who's not here, are uh, an outstanding group of undergraduate uh, research assistants who really uh, deserve most of the credit for the empirical work that uh, went into this. And they're all interested in graduate school, so I hope that you guys will get a chance to know them. Um, so, um, you know, I think if there's one area of economics where philosophy and economics have tended to intersect, it's optimal tax theory. And in fact, that's true not just uh, at present, but historically. Uh, William Vickery's famous uh, 1945 article uh, both proposed in the modern literature the idea of the veil of ignorance that has become so central to uh, uh, justice, the theory of justice in philosophy, and the problem of optimal taxation that has become the subject of a very large literature uh, in economics. And the basic idea uh, of Vickery's argument was that um, optimal taxation should be thought of as the optimal design of an insurance contract that would be signed by individuals uh, prior to their knowing the position that they held within society uh, from an original uh, position. And um, if you think about the sorts of things people would like from an original position to insure themselves against, a natural one that arises is what society one is born into. Because that has a huge impact on one's life's prospects. Um, and yet, despite that, the uh, standard literature on optimal taxation within economics considers uh, redistribution, insurance schemes, that occur only within the borders of sovereign states. That is, uh, in some sense, the veil of ignorance that people are behind uh, before they're born is more like a flag bandana that reveals to them only the country in which they are to live, but nothing else about their future. And that seems quite strange, uh, because such an analysis really misses many of the things that I think we should be interested in from the perspective of justice. Uh, for example, most inequality, as I'll show in a minute, is across rather than within countries. And therefore, much of the action that we can get out of an optimal social insurance model does not appear <coughs> if we only consider redistribution within uh, sovereign states. Um, Second, even if we dismiss the transfers that such a model would tend to call for across countries, the very limitation that we place on ourselves against such transfers will naturally call for other sorts of policies, which are ones that are not typically analyzed uh, in standard public finance models. And there's no real framework to deal with them, such as migration across countries, unless you consider uh, the value of different people in different places in the world, it's really not coherent to think about optimal migratory policy. Third, um, if and to the extent, uh, which I will argue there's a substantial extent, that there are trade-offs between domestic justice and justice across countries, uh, optimal policies within countries should be significantly impacted by considerations from a global perspective, even if we're not directly considering uh, policies that, um, that occur on a more uh, international scale. And therefore, thinking about justice from a global perspective should, will affect our opinions about classical questions like optimal taxation. And finally, um, given the very sharp distinctions that exist between what would naturally seem to be optimal global social insurance policy and what is actually implemented in practice, it might lead one to question some of the normative standards that are used to reach 
uh, those types of conclusions. Um, and that can be important not just for philosophy, but also for domestic analyses of optimal taxation. Because after reflecting on the implications on the global stage and potentially rejecting the normative foundations uh, of our domestic policies there, we might come to reconsider policies within countries as well. So what I'm going to try to do today is provide a first pass analysis of a problem of optimal global social insurance subject to various feasibility uh, constraints that are typically considered uh, in a domestic uh, global, uh, sorry, domestic um, public finance perspective. And this will be interspersed with some discussion uh, by Christian about how philosophers have approached these issues and might react to some of these dilemmas. Okay, so there's technological differences between the disciplines, and I think philosophy is a little bit behind economics. But I'm going to do my best with this uh, with this <laughs> te new te te technology that I'm trying to adapt to. So a lot of the the puzzles and issues that Glenn brings up in his empirical work are issues that you would expect and want philosophy to have something to say about. In particular, some of the trade-offs that he raises and. What is interesting to me is the ways in which a lot of the philosophical literature that has focused on global justice hasn't really engaged with some of these questions of trade-offs. So I think this is a, a very uh, clear way in which uh, what Itai mentioned at the outset, where engagement can help with the development actually of ideal theory in philosophy, as well as just questions of application of philosophical doctrine to, to practice. OK, so for the last 30 or 40 years, at least, there's been a lot of interest in discussions of domestic justice with equality. Right? That is the idea that in assessing social institutions, we should pay some attention in some way to distributive shares, equality and distributive shares. Now, there's been a lot of disagreement in this literature about just what type of distributive standard you should be applying, about what um, about what types of inequalities can be justified and on what terms. There's also been disagreement in this literature about what's sometimes called the site of justice. That is that when we're evaluating, um, when we're evaluating behavior, we should be focusing on the design of institutions or on more broad topics like the social ethos and people's individual choices. Now, the, the literature on global justice has focused on a new question, and that is what I call the question of scope. And by the question of scope is that whatever, developed, whatever theory is developed at the domestic level for the valuation of social institutions, and I'll focus simply on that, um, we might ask whether or not it's applicable on the global plane. Right? So the question of scope is whether or not we need to simply extend the standards which are deemed appropriate for the valuation of social institutions in the domestic context to the global plane. OK, so I divide in sort of a rough, in a rough way the philosophical literature into sort of two schools of thought, one which I call the extenders. And the view of the extenders has generally been, yes, what, we, what global justice is, in a way, is domestic justice writ large. That is, that we need to simply apply many of the types of criteria we've been developing for evaluating social institutions domestically to the global sphere. The restrictors, on the other hand, say no. That is, they give arguments to the effect that there's something special about domestic justice that warrants the application of egalitarian standards of justice concerned with distributive shares that doesn't hold globally. Um, now, these two schools d d disagree um, amongst themselves about a great many things. Um, but what restrictors share is the view that there are some important disanalogies between the global and the domestic that warrant the application of different principles of justice within them. Right? And the, the form of argument that the case for restriction has taken has been to identify some feature that is present in the domestic realm, which is not present or not present to an adequate degree in the global realm to activate these types of demands of justice. So generally, the, the structure of the argument is both an empirical claim about this disanalogy and then a moral claim that this empirical disanalogy is morally relevant. Okay. Um, 
so what are these types of, of uh, things that restrictors have focused on? Well, they'll say, well, you know, Rawls and people writing in, in, in ways that are influenced by him were interested in the question of the basic structure. That is the basic structure of a society, the rules and um, norms that govern interactions between participants within that society. And many of the restrictors have argued that there, isn't, there either isn't a basic structure in Rawls' sense globally or that it's different in character and fundamental ways that make the types of principles that he was interested in um, inapplicable. Now, what reasons? Well, he, so, uh, different theorists have emphasized different things. Some have focused on the, the idea of social cooperation and the idea of social institutions of the basic structure as a cooperative scheme for mutual advantage, which they think is not present, or at least not present in the adequate degree in the global sphere to trigger these demands of justice. Um, another is this factor of coercion, the idea that in the domestic sphere, we are all bound together by rules and institutions which are coercively imposed by all on all. Um, and this gives a special concern for equality of treatment of those who are stand in this relation to one another. And then there have been others, national, so-called sort of liberal nationalists, who focus on the importance of a shared culture or shared nationality in triggering demands for concern with equality or in justifying particular types of special duties that are owed to co-nationals which are not owed to non-nationals. Again, now extenders deny these. They, they have denied these arguments. And as I mentioned, that the, the argument of any of these types of restrictors uh, assert both an empirical claim and a moral claim based on that empirical claim. And uh, the extenders can be distinguished in terms of what their emphasis is in challenging these arguments of restrictors. So what I'm calling an associative duty uh, extender is someone who doesn't deny what the restrictors assert, namely that our concern with equality is only triggered when people stand in a particular type of associative relation with one another, whether it be being part of a joint um, system of social cooperation or whether it be um, collectively upholding and also complying with rules which are coercively imposed. Um, but they say that, uh, in fact, these triggers of concern with equality are also present globally. So they'll say, well, it doesn't look like there's anything like a state at the international level, but nevertheless, that doesn't mean that there isn't coercion at the international level. So they emphasize very different things, including incipient institutions of global governance, but also just features like the modern state, which of course is an institution. The world is not naturally carved up into states with rights allocated to it. Um, that is a relatively recent development, and we can, of course, imagine a world in which there aren't anything quite like states or that they don't have all the privileges and rights that they currently enjoy. And in fact, the state system as it stands is something that is collectively upheld, although in a dispersed way, and imposed on all. So that would be one way in which people often type of try to challenge um, without, under, without challenging the premise that um, coercion is relevant for triggering duties of egalitarian justice, the implication that it doesn't apply globally. Um, and then there are others who challenge it in different ways, saying that, look, you know, it, there may be all these disanalogies between uh, the domestic and the global empirical disanalogies, but none of these empirical disanalogies is morally relevant. Right? Namely that, you know, it may well be that um, there are types of associative connection that operate domestically that don't operate globally, but why should we believe that those are necessary to trigger demands with equality? Right? So that concern with equality on this type of view is based on sort of a general duty. And there are many ways of making out this type of idea, but one was sort of implicit in what, in Glenn's opening statements, uh, is the idea that why should people be worse off through um, no fault of their own as a result of certain arbitrary features, um, including their place of birth, right? So this type of approach simply denies the idea that there need to be special triggers for concern with equality. Okay, um, now I just want to st stop my, my initial presentation by saying that um, neither the restrictors nor the uh, extenders have to my mind, really engaged in as much detail as would be desirable with some of these issues of trade-offs. Um, 
for example, restrictors who say that we, shouldn't, we need not be concerned with equality of distributive shares globally, nevertheless, most of them posit some sort of duty of assistance, that is, some duty to uh, ensure that people have at least some level of sufficiency, uh, so, uh, an adequate standard of living, however, however understood. Um, but they haven't actually thought about um, how this duty, this duty to promote sufficiency, is related to this domestic duty to ensure equality of global, global um, sorry, e uh, equality of shares domestically. Right? And of course, there could be trade-offs between these values. Just saying that you don't care about equality globally doesn't mean that there aren't trade-offs between the global and domestic insofar as it's going to be a relatively open-ended project of trying to achieve sufficiency, and that can be traded off against equality, concerns with equality or concerns with the absolute level of the domestic society itself. So, and, uh, ex and I think extenders have also not traded, uh, have not um, engaged with these questions, partly because a lot of the, the intuitive force of their arguments have come by introducing the dramatic disparities of wealth between, say, the, you know, the top 10% and the bottom 10% globally, or even between the bottom 50% and the top 10% top, top globally, and saying, well, obviously there's something morally problematic about this. Um, but of course, when can think that there's something morally problematic about that and not nevertheless be comfortable with the idea that you know, any time you can promote equality globally, you ought to do so regardless of how that affects specifically your own domestic society, including whether or not it, it undermines the position of the less advantaged participants within your society. Right? Now, this is not to say that their views couldn't be, couldn't be read to have um, ex natural extensions and implications for these views, but it's just not been an issue they've been discussed. And as a result, I think that they haven't really articulated just the very the nature of this extension because it's perfectly consistent with thinking that we should be concerned with equality globally and domestically with thinking that nevertheless the stringency of our obligations to promote one or the other could be varied, right? So that it's not obvious how the trade-offs work there. Okay, so I'll turn it back to Glenn for... Great. Yeah. Thanks, Christian. And I am now going to uh, move forward uh, by ignoring most of the subtleties that uh, <laughs> Christian just raised and instead using what might be dubbed a ex very radical extender view, which is just to take the standard public finance, most simplistic public finance perspective of utilitarian, log utility, quasi-linear, no income effects, it's yada, 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 that uh, is used for analyzing domestic uh, optimal taxation um, and I'm going to do that for uh, a couple reasons. One is that it is useful in order to put things into very sharp quantitative terms so that you can see how large some of these effects are. Um, and second, while we can discuss sensitivity later, I think some of Christian's discussion already shows you that many of the challenges that are raised under this simplistic way of looking at things will continue to apply uh, under a morally broader uh, perspective on some of these issues. Okay, so and if you take a log utility perspective, that is people's uh, welfare is, the, uh, uh, is equal to the logarithm of their material uh, income, there's a very natural way to measure inequality, which is the mean log deviation of income. That is the difference between the logarithm of the average income and the average of the logarithm of income which is the utility gain that accrues from a perfect uh, redistribution where everyone has equal uh, shares but the same total wealth. Um, and the nice thing about this is it can be very easily decomposed uh, across countries into different components uh, and so forth. And this will give me a common denominator for talking about all the different issues of inequality that will come up uh, during my analysis. Um, and most of my focus is going to be on inequality rather than on absolute levels of income, just because I think that the trade-off between inequality and income within a country is something we already understand well, so I want to instead focus on the trade-off between inequality within a country and inequality on a global scale. Okay, so uh, this, uh, again, with the tip of the hat to the research assistants, deserves much more than a line, but Basically, we estimated parametrically the distribution of global income uh, worldwide. Um, and we found 
that, and this is very consistent with other studies of similar issues, the inequality within countries is approximately 0.27 log points and across countries is about 0.47 log points. So about 64% of global inequality is across rather than within countries. And that means that eliminating all global inequality would be equivalent uh, in a utilitarian perspective to increasing average incomes of all people in the world by 110%, while eliminating all within country inequality would only be worth a 31% increase in global income. And to show this graphically, what we did is we constructed an average within country income distribution and a cross country income distribution. The first was constructed by normalizing by average income in countries and then population weighting the uh, quantiles of the distribution. Um, and then the world income is basically just a histogram, which is why it's so lumpy, because there's a couple of countries that are right here and here, China and India, that create these really big spikes. But what you can clearly see, despite that lumpiness, is there's just a lot more inequality across countries than there is within countries. There's a lot more people down near here in the world income distribution than there is in the average uh, within country distribution. And there's a lot more countries up out here than there are people within countries who are making it up that high. Okay, so this naturally suggests that most redistribution should optimally be across rather than within countries. And to study this formally, I uh, used the uh, Vickery optimal uh, redistribution model, which has the classic uh, trade-off between equity and efficiency. On the one hand, the poor have a greater marginal utility of income, and therefore taxation that moves resources from the rich to them uh, will make a more uh, socially efficient use of those resources, but uh, that taxation reduces incentives to work and therefore shrinks the size of pie, the pie that we can then redistribute. Now this model is usually applied within the context of sovereign countries, and I uh, will do that, but I also want to compare a country by country optimal income tax within that country to one that's applied on the global scale. And I'm going to make tons of simplifying assumptions to sort of maximize the transparency of this. Uh, in particular, in addition to the things I've already said, I'm going to assume that we only have access to a linear income tax. As you'll see, uh, as should be intuitive, um, things will be even more dramatic if you allow nonlinear income taxes, because you'll be able to even more extract from uh, the wealthy, but you'll get much of the sense of what's going on just out of the results for a linear income tax. So the nice thing about the linear income tax, along with all of the assumptions that I've made so far, is it leads to an extremely simple closed form uh, expression for optimal taxation. In particular, the optimal tax rate is just a measure of inequality, which I denote iota, uh, over that measure of inequality plus the elasticity of uh, labor supply. So as the elasticity of labor supply rises, the um, income tax rate falls. So uh, as there's more distortion from taxes, uh, the optimal tax rate is smaller. As there's more inequality, the optimal tax rate is larger. This measure of inequality is uh, the negative of the covariance between uh, welfare weights, which Stephanie will talk extensively about uh, this afternoon, and uh, pre-tax income of uh, individuals. And uh, the nice thing about this is it gives us a no notion of inequality, which is not just relevant for welfare, but which is relevant for policy. So if we can measure this uh, notion of inequality, we can also measure um, what would be the optimal taxes and how those compare across uh, to within countries. And therefore, it gives a good intuition for why uh, the greater global inequality should drive greater taxation on a global than a domestic scale. So let me just give you uh, some of the results. We assume different constant values of the labor supply elasticity. Let me focus on this column here of elasticity of 0.3 because that's sort of, I think, our best guess baseline analysis. What you find is that tax rates on, in the global regime are about 59%, whereas the average tax rate within a country is only 39%. That's because inequality is about twice as large on the global scale than it is within countries, even after you uh, uh, put in those optimal higher taxes. That leads to a 
log point reduction in global inequality when you have the global regime, but only a 0.27 uh, log point reduction in inequality when you have the optimal domestic regime. And that eliminates 85% of global inequality, even using a linear tax, um, within in the global regime, but only 31% within the domestic regime. Now, um, it may immediately occur to you, as it should, that in fact, uh, both we gain a huge amount more from uh, the global redistribution, but in fact, uh, almost all such transfers that exist are within countries. So according to our calculations, less than 1% of across country inequality uh, is reduced by transfers that occur across countries, whereas about 31% of within country inequality is eliminated by tax and transfers within countries, and a much higher fraction if you consider uh, developed countries like the OECD. Uh, in the optimal scheme, the United States should be sending somewhere between $25,000 and $30,000 per person uh, abroad each year. Um, but if you actually look at what countries do send the most, it's not anyone like the US. Uh, it's the Gulf Cooperation Council countries uh, like Saudi Arabia, uh, Kuwait, uh, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar. And I'm going to come back. These countries are going to play a very important role in some of my analysis in a bit. And I'll talk about why they send so much more. But just to give you a sense for the magnitudes, the, in one of these countries, uh, typical per person uh, sending abroad, mostly because of remittances, is about $3,000 per person, whereas in Norway it's about $200. And Norway is the most generous of the OECD countries. Um, so why is there this huge discrepancy between what we should be doing from uh, this utilitarian perspective and what, in fact, we do uh, do? So I think there are a few reactions one could have. One is the simplest, but in many ways the most radical, which is that current policy is just unjust. Um, and uh, we should try to change it and should try to achieve the utilitarian optimum. A second perspective is that the normative standards that uh, I've been applying these utilitarian global standards are wrong. And you could clearly see other normative standards that might uh, weaken these, like ones that care about comparative income within countries or a more libertarian standard. But I think a wide range of liberal egalitarian standards are going to have a very hard time not reaching some extent of uh, this conclusion that we should have these massive transfers across countries. But immediately, that is going to raise important trade-offs that Christian will return to about um, if we're charging an optimal tax and basically extracting as much as we can from the wealthy, that money either has to go to the domestic poor or to the foreign poor. So you're immediately going to face trade-offs, even if you have access to a very rich tax system, maybe even especially if you have access to it, between distributing to the domestic poor and the global poor. Third reaction that one might have, and there's some literature that argues this, is that transfers to the poor would basically just be wasted, and so they're not worth giving. And I think you know, if you do a broad, you know, fair reading of the literature, there you know, are certainly some people who believe some amount is wasted. But a huge, huge amount would have to be wasted or genuinely counterproductive in order for it not to be optimal to be sending a lot to uh, very poor places. Just one way to think about this is imagine that you could take money from the average person in the United States and redistribute it to Warren Buffett. And Warren Buffett then consumed 50% of it and sent 50% of it to the Gates Foundation. And then the Gates Foundation wasted 75% of it and then gave it to the world's poor. It would still be dramatically welfare enhancing uh, to, to do that. So it just shows you that you, there would have to be a huge amount of slippage not to want to do a lot more than we do in terms of helping the poorest people in the world. And I think you know the most logical explanation for this is that there are real constraints based on the willingness of those who currently benefit from the structure of international institutions to participate in a global uh, redistributive scheme. And that we should, if we believe that that's a main reason why this is not happening, take those constraints as a serious check on our ability to achieve optimal global social insurance. And as a result, we should think about policies that can help uh, address this problem while still achieving some of our global social justice goals. And one of those I'm going to suggest in a minute after Christian speaks is migration. Um, 
And uh, that can also help uh, overcome the problem that money would be wasted in the poor countries. Okay, so the, um, Glenn just mentioned migration. And so, you know, one thing that we discuss in our paper is a question, if you liberalize migration, um, what would sort of be the effects and would this be something that would be desirable from the point of view of different theories of global justice? So we imagine a, a case in which there would be liberalization of migrations from poor countries to wealthy countries um, and it would be a policy option would be available such that there could be internal redistributions in the receiving country such that everybody in the receiving country could be made better off or that equality wouldn't be eroded. But as a matter of fact, this would be blocked. Right? So it would be blocked simply because of a lack of political will or something of that sort. So that the basic trade-off would not be between um, uh, keeping all of the domestic less advantaged people at or above their current level and improving the life prospects of disadvantaged globally, but faced with a trade-off between promoting the, the level of advantage of the global disadvantaged and the domestic disadvantaged. And the question is, how ought we look at that? Okay, well, let's look first just at egalitarian. So one view would be, of course, that any of these egalitarians might view it as undesirable in the sense that they say that we would do best, of course, to have the option of liberalization plus some sort of internal redistribution such that the potential risks to the current domestic disadvantage would be offset. Right? But given that that option is unavailable, how should we evaluate this? Well, one view, which I sort of call boundless egalitarianism, would look at this as a straightforward justice gain, right? So that uh, insofar as we care about equality um, or poverty or whatever it is, um, then we simply shouldn't be concerned with um, who the identities of the individuals who are made better off or worse off is, right? So we adopt some sort of anonymity condition when it comes to this, right? Um, now, again, that's a, a perfectly, that, that's an interesting view. And one of the things I try to push is that this is a type of trade-off that people who have advocated global egalitarianism have not really focused on. And I think that one of the reasons they haven't focused on it is that many people would be alarmed or upset by the prospect that um, you would, it would just be an obvious thing that you would adopt a policy of liberalization, liberalization uh, immigration liberalization or trade liberalization or any such policy if the net effect was that you were improving the position of people who were overseas um, but you would undermine the position of the domestic poor. That's something that is that at least intuitively many people have a problem with. Now maybe it's just one of these cases where that's uh, an issue where you just have to do the best you can under constraints and it's it's regrettable but it's nevertheless just. But at the very least that's that's an implication that should be highlighted rather than downplayed in evaluating what form of egalitarian concern we should show globally. So the boundless egalitarianism would simply say yes that's a justice gain, go ahead with it. If people are, uh, find that to be problematic, if it seems that, no, we, we have some reason to be particularly concerned about uh, the level of advantage of compatriots in this way, such that although we owe some concern for, the, for, the, for global equality, we shouldn't embrace it when it would be undermining domestic equality or the position of the less advantaged domestically, um, we should attach different kind of importance to these goals. Well, what importance could it be? Well, one, one very sharp extreme view would be sort of lexical priority. So the idea is that you, know, at, you should always be trying to promote the level of advantage of the domestic disadvantaged or promote domestic equality. And only then can you look at these other issues. Right? Um, that would be in a, in a, in a, in a very strong form. Um, or you could give different kinds of weighting to the concerns with these sorts of objectives. Now. One, ad, I, one potential advantage of this type of view is that it may serve to capture many people's considered judgments about these trade-offs, namely that it's permissible for a domestic society, if it's faced with the question of how to distribute resources, to, take, to uh, pay extra attention to the way in which they might improve the position of the least advantaged domestically, um, while nevertheless not going all the way to the restrictor camp and saying, that we don't have to show concern with equality globally at all. Um, I think the problem, of course, is that it needs to be motivated theoretically, right? So what kinds of grounds could you give if you are 
especially if you embrace the kinds of intuitions that seem to motivate egalitarianism generally, this idea of people not being allowed to be worse off through no fault of their own and simply as a result of morally arbitrary factors like place of birth, how is it that you then motivate the idea that nevertheless there should be some restrictions on the degree to which we prioritize this concern with global equality? Um, and I suspect that you know, the, 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 the most natural way for people who embrace this sort of bounded egalitarianism to go would be to stress some of the same factors that the restrictors stress in trying to argue why we shouldn't extend concern with equality globally, um, but nevertheless employ these arguments in a different way. That is, trying to show that although there is sufficient degree of cooperation or coercive shared institutions worldwide or commonalities um, to justify concern with equality, nevertheless these kinds of relations are denser within a society and that this warrants a special concern within a society. So the, the purpose to which this argument would be put would not be to dismiss concern with equality globally, but rather to give differential importance to it to equality domestically. Another um, issue that comes up, and this is for restrictors, again, looking at the kinds of trade-offs that Glenn is talking about, is what I mentioned between equality domestically and sufficiency globally. So a great many of the people, Tom Nagel, um, Alan Buchanan, Ronald Dworkin, basically all of that entire generation of great political theorists embrace what I'm calling a restrictor view. That is that they think that there are these very robust duties of egalitarian justice domestically and much more limited duties globally. Uh, at least limited in the sense that they don't require concern with equality. But all of them do posit some sort of duty of assistance or some sort of duty either of, of humanitarian duty or a duty of justice to promote the adequate standard of living of everyone everywhere. And of course, even if you hold that view, many of the trade-offs that Glenn mentioned still come into the picture because you don't have to be concerned with equality globally to be concerned with sufficiency globally. And these trade-offs have a lot to do with sufficiency given that the people who would be coming in have, have, have very little, right? So there the question is how, how to, to balance these concerns with domestic justice. And insofar as you have resources available which can be put to different purposes which might improve your domestic justice, um, how that's traded off against this other concern with sufficiency globally. Now again, there are um, different options. Um, you know, one is you could say, well, we only get to this concern with sufficiency after we've already gotten all the justice, all the justice done at home domestically, right? That seems, that would be a, a very sort of extreme view in the sense that it would would diminish quite significantly the importance of this duty of assistance. Right? On the other hand, you could sort of simply see them as, um, well, wait, standing in some sort of waiting, or of course you could give particular level of concern for, you could uh, enter other factors like the absolute level of deprivation and how that would be offset relative to what you would be offsetting domestically and so on. Another issue which um, is again not sort of discussed I think adequately in light of this, in this little literature on restriction, is, um, is the issue of equality and affluence, right? So if you, if you maintain that, that the very, the nature of domestic society, the types of relations that we stand into one another mean that we have to be concerned with distributive shares and that doesn't hold globally. Well, that doesn't say anything about how affluent we should think that our society ought to be or what the absolute level of living standards should be, right? So even if we think that it would be an, it would be an undue restriction on someone's autonomy, um, if we were coercively imposing on them institutional arrangements that meant that they had significantly smaller share of valued goods than others, it doesn't follow from that that we think that it would be unjust for us to be collectively imposing a set of institutions that make them um, absolutely worse off than they might otherwise be um, under some alternative. Right? So there's this question of how we should be thinking about affluence as opposed to equality versus this duty of sufficiency. Um, and again, there isn't very much discussion in this, in this literature on restriction, but it seems very important to the evaluation of the theory. So just as I said with the global egalitarians that 
they get a kind of intuitive oomph behind their theories by contrasting this situation where these vast disparities of wealth to where we redistribute from top to, to bottom in some way, um, that they need to consider these, these cases where the, the distributional changes are not happening from the extremes, but somewhere from the, the bottom and the very bottom. Um, so too, I think, for the, the type of view that has been advocated by Rawls, Miller, the two Millers, Tom Nagel, so on and so forth, it gets a kind of um, attractive glow by saying that, look, we don't care about equality globally, but we do care about sufficiency. So that there, you know, what might seem to be a kind of morally obtuseness of that view is, is undermined by this positing of this duty. And yet, of course, just what that theory means depends very much on the extent of the duty and how it relates to these concerns with, with distributive justice domestically. So now, given that um, I want to move beyond transfers to ways in which we might promote global equality that are perhaps less costly to those in wealthy countries and less reliant on good institutions in uh, poor countries. So uh, it, might, uh, it might seem mechanically that migration is global equality enhancing because you think of people moving from poor countries uh, to rich countries, but that's uh, pretty clearly not true as a simple example in illustrates. Imagine that you have like a financial whiz kid in India who's currently earning a bit above global mean income, which is like a king's ransom in India, but is pretty poor by the standards of the West. And um, he then moves to the United States, joins Goldman Sachs, and makes a million dollars a year. That's exactly the sort of upward mobility that many people would say is responsible for dramatic global inequality, not uh, the sort of thing that combats it. But obviously, whether that is sort of the typical case or whether most of the time people are really moving from poverty to a reasonable standard of living is going to depend critically on which people are migrating from what countries in what professions to what countries in what professions. And to look at that, uh, I got data on global migration by country, by occupation. Uh, and used methods, I basically built a model that fit causal micro studies of the wage gains from people moving cross countries and then extrapolated that to a global uh, system, assuming away general equilibrium effects and assuming that all incidents fell on the migrants and focused on inequality to get the change in the mean log deviation in income that's created by those uh, migrations. And what uh, I found was that the total reduction in global inequality is about 7.5 times 10 to the negative 3. To put that in perspective, that's about one-third of the reduction in global inequality that occurs as a result of taxes and transfers within the OECD. So it's quite large, but not enormous. But it's highly heterogeneous by country. For example, the migrant flows from Mexico and Central America to the United States do more than the total global flow to reduce global inequality but then they're dramatically offset by migration from Canada to the Un United States, which increases global inequality. Um, Ireland uh, has a dramatic effect increasing global inequality uh, because of migration from upper middle income but not wealthy uh, European countries like depressed parts of the United Kingdom and Poland. But if you put things in per person terms, which perhaps is the most relevant, the real outliers are the, are the GCC countries. So let me just show you a graph of that. On the left here, I've put on the horizontal axis post-tax uh, post internal inequality in countries. And on the vertical axis, uh, the reduction in global inequality resulting from migration to those countries per person in those countries. So these are in the same act, uh, units. So what you basically see is there's a big cluster up here of roughly OECD countries. And then there's this long tail of countries over here, which are all in the GCC. Um, and these countries are so unequal that they really make all the OECD countries look exactly the same. Uh, and, but they also do far more, like an order of magnitude more than any OECD country does to reduce global inequality. And the interesting thing is, while there's an extremely strong negative relationship here, even if you wait by the small populations of these countries, there's almost no relationship when you look within the OECD countries there's Hong Kong and Singapore, which our data are a little bit bad on, which are sort of like the GCC countries, uh, we think. 
but, um, but within the standard OECD countries, there's at most a very uh, small negative relationship. Um, so given that most of this relationship is driven by those GCC outliers, Looking at correlations, I don't think, is really the right way to think about this. What we really want to think about is what's actually going on in these countries and does it make sense why there is this relationship. Um, and I think that these countries really are a fascinating example. I think if there's sort of any point I want you to take away from this analysis, it's that we should think of there being an OECD model as to how to run a society and a GCC model as to how to run a society and think about what we think about the comparison between those. So in the GCC countries, between, uh, depending on whether you're over here with Saudi Arabia or whether you're over here as Qatar, somewhere between 30 to 95% of these countries' populations are constituted of uh, extremely poor uh, migrant workers who live on about three to $6,000 a year. And the elite of these countries, especially in places like Qatar, live on somewhere between six and seven figures. Uh, in Qatar, the average income among the elite is something like a million and a half dollars a year. Um, and that is far more in terms of a ratio of differences than any estimate that is, uh, I've ever seen of the difference in material living standards between slaves and masters in the U.S. South. Um, so in some sense, these are the most extreme form of slavery, and the people living there have just as few rights, essentially, as uh, slaves uh, in the U.S. South did. And this leads to an almost insane uh, level of inequality in these countries. Uh, the Gini is a very nonlinear standard, so it's hard to really get a sense for it from the Gini, but these places have Ginis on the order of 80 to 90. Um, which, and if you put it in terms of mean log deviation of income, it's an order of magnitude bigger than the United States, which is the most unequal uh, OECD country uh, other than Chile. Uh, but in terms of per person contributions to global inequality reduction, these countries are doing more than anywhere in the world by any reasonable standard. Uh, if their um, inequality reduction in Qatar or the UAE per person living in that country, and that's not just per citizen, that's per all people, including the 95% of migrants, is uh, about three times the reduction in inequality from the strongest OECD tax and transfer system. Um, and if you put it in per native terms, these places are like orders of magnitude more than the uh, OECD is doing. Um, now, why might we expect these countries to be so unequal at the same time? Well, it's kind of obvious. You know, there's a huge number of poor people moving to these countries. Unless you're giving them all an equal share of the country's wealth, it's almost inevitable that you're going to get massive inequality. And in fact, if you just think through it intuitively and think through history and just reflect, it's hard to imagine such a massive and unequal migration taking place on terms of much greater equality than it's taking place in these places. Think of the slave uh, migration, uh, slave trade to the United States uh, and other parts of the Americas, the Bracero program in the United States, Singapore. If you just think, Almost any time there's such a large migration of extremely poor uh, people to a wealthy place, it's hard to imagine that it's going to occur on terms of near equality. So that suggests that there may be a trade-off between countries being open to equality globally and to migration flows that reduce inequality globally uh, and uh, inequality within that country. Um, and there's other reasons why you might think that such a trade-off exists. For example, there's a large literature suggesting that diversity within countries uh, undermines support for redistribution within those countries. Um, and there's a number of historical examples that su are suggestive of that. Especially interesting, I find, the fact that the U US and South Africa have seen the largest rise in top income shares, uh, both after experiencing uh, dramatic deracializations. Um, and there's lots of other examples. But all these things suggest to me that at least in an important set of cases, especially when you're considering extreme events with large societal changes that can therefore have a large potential impact on either domestic or global uh, equality, there's likely to be important cases of a trade-off between domestic and global equality. And let me just tell you a little sort of fairy tale that illustrates uh, the, the types of things that I'm um, thinking about.
So imagine there are two countries, one rich and one poor, let's call them North and South. Uh, North is so much richer than South is that even the poor people in North are richer than uh, the rich people in South. And part of the reason why this is the case is that people feel more sympathy for those who are physically or emotionally proximate than to people who are physically or emotionally distant to them. And as a result, uh, people in North make sure that no one in North lives uh, in too much poverty. Now, a Pareto improvement is possible in this world. People from South could move to North, and they could work on wages that are great by their standards, but very low, uh, in fact, you know, pover utter poverty by the standards of North. But Northerners don't want to allow this to take place. Why? Because they're afraid that once the Southerners move, that they'll feel sympathy for them, and they'll want to bring them up to the standards of living of North, and then it will no longer be a Pareto improvement because the transfers that will be necessary to do that will be large enough uh, that they won't uh, gain from it. You can imagine many other mechanisms that would have a similar effect and implications to this, like fears that if they move that there could be a revolution within the country, or constraints constitutionally that force egalitarianism and sharing with the migrants. Now imagine that a racist ideologue comes along in North and convinces people that Southerners are genetically inferior and therefore are not worth providing any aid to because they'll just waste it. Um, that could actually, if it spread, allow the migration to take place and make everyone better off. Um, because it kills the threat that sympathy would uh, uh, cause the trade not to be Pareto improving. Now, that would make everyone better off, but with time you would imagine that some uh, of the more enlightened people in the North would get to know the Southerners, realize they're not actually all that different except for maybe their cultural milieu, um, and therefore, um, they would realize that they had just been you know, taught a myth, and there would be a movement for Southerner rights that would restore equality within the country, but in the process, cut off migration to the country because of fears of exactly this dynamic. Um, and you would imagine that maybe at that point, actually, the past of having treated the Southerners in their midst so terribly would be viewed uh, as a source of shame for Northerners, at least until some economist comes along and points out that without this, uh, everyone would have been worse off, and in fact, all of those Southerners would counterfactually still be back in South, and you would still give just as little uh, about them uh, as you do uh, about everyone else who's in South, uh, suffering in the most abject poverty and violence um, without uh, engendering any uh, social movements or compassion. Um, now, of course, uh, this economist uh, would be first maligned as being a racist, and then uh, when he insists that, um, in fact, uh, he wants to include South in the system of global uh, social insurance, he would be called a, you know, a dreamer uh, and delusional. Um, so uh, if you think about, uh, I think there's sort of two types of implications uh, one can draw from this. One, one is sort of philosophical, but one is actually quite practical. So if you think about, you know, what are the biggest public policy issues on the U.S. Uh, agenda right now, optim you know, taxation plays some role, and we're certainly all in this room very focused on that issue. But you know, migration is actually a much bigger issue in the United States right now. And we really have no framework in public finance for thinking about these issues. And if you just take a simple global egalitarian framework, you immediately see trade-offs that are begging for economists to quantify them. So for example, if you imagine there was a proposal on the table where we would shut off the borders of the United States in exchange for giving more rights to migrants who are currently living in the United States. Uh, that's something which most liberals uh, in the United States are pretty sympathetic to. But this sort of a perspective might lead you to question that if you thought it would actually be effective at shutting off the borders. Because the gains for those who come to the United States might be much greater than are the gains for the people already in the United States uh, who would then have greater equality domestically. Uh, I think this can also show why Gary's uh, suggestion that we should auction off rights to migrate would, from a utilitarian perspective, be a disaster. Um, and it might even lead one to oppose movements for greater rights uh, uh, for 
domestic migrants like those led by people like Cesar Chavez. At a broader philosophical level, I think it, it really challenges, you know, in some ways, some of the fundamental fibers of what we think about morally. You know, is the OECD model or the GCC model superior? You know, you can calculate that if you were to spread the GCC model to the OECD, you could eliminate most of global inequality. But on the other hand, I think any time you even start to think about these societies, every instinct morally that you have fights against the idea of wanting to live in such a society. And yet, is that revulsion that we feel a sufficient reason to deny the demands of really the neediest and most desperate people in the world? Another question is, you know, within the OECD countries, which countries deserve praise or blame? Many egalitarian liberals look to Sweden and you know, Nordic countries as ideal societies. But if you had the sort of diversity that we have in the United States, almost mechanically, those societies would actually be less equal uh, than the United States is. So is it really appropriate for us to blame the United States just for having a more diverse and more open uh, society? And I think you know, one way to retreat from this that Christian was uh, sort of suggesting is to just rely on ideal theory and say, no, we should give money to the global poor and we should solve domestic equality and so forth. But I really think that that is a bankrupt attitude to take. And the reason is that while on some issues, we, like maybe free trade, we could say, well, we're advocating for the right thing, but policymakers just won't listen. But this is an area where I truly believe that we as an intellectual class, not just economists, but the intellectual class more broadly, are the ones who have pushed these liberal egalitarian ideas upon society. And so if it is us, in some sense, that are constraining society from adopting something like the GCC model, we have to take responsibility for the consequences that that has for the most desperate people in the world. I think in, the, in contrasting the OECD model and the GCC model, there are a couple of things that are interesting. I mean, one is, of course, that it's, we should not consider these sort of trade-offs if we can avoid them. That is, if there are policies that could be adapted, adopted such that you would be able to serve one objective, that is, of promoting the level of advantage of people who are currently disadvantaged, while at the same time um, treating them decently, right, by, by not subjecting to these types of, of position, then that's clearly what you ought to do, right? But nevertheless, insofar as that sort of policy combination is being blocked, then you have to consider, well, what, from the point of view of justice, is preferable? Now, of course, that's not, it's a weird kind of way of thinking, because it's, you, you would say what's preferable is something altogether different. And in a way, something is always going wrong when either of these models are going to be adopted, right? But that we do get some traction if we evaluate them comparatively with one another, because it also then gives a different type of reflection on how we regard one model that is actually dominant where we live. So if it looks on reflection like the GCC model um, is in some way not obviously inferior from the point of view of justice overall to the OECD model, um, if we take this sufficiently global perspective, um, then, but, and we feel revulsion when we think about the GCC model, but somehow we don't think revulsion when it comes to evaluating the OECD model, at least maybe we, we judge it hard, so we don't feel revulsion, well then this might be a type of argument that would cause us to reevaluate the, the degree to which we're sanguine about the OECD model and to create a greater urgency to, the, uh, to trying to adopt policies, to promote policies which avoid these kinds of trade-offs altogether. So again, um, I think um, when, when these types of optimal combinations of policies are blocked, we often have two values in tension, tension. This idea that, well, people are not being treated decently, they're not being treated fairly, and yet at the same time, their well-being is being promoted relative to what it would be without this indecent treatment. This is something that arises in questions of exploitation more generally. Um, so I think I'll just end with that. I think we're out of time. Thanks. Uh, yes, so uh, Glenn, thanks very much for a very provocative uh, uh, proposal. I think we learn a lot from it. Uh, I just want to come back to the rest, last point that has been uh, raised, and I think uh, one fundamental tension here is what we plus, uh, place as, at the core of our theory of justice. Mm -hmm. And because you made the assumption that our theory of justice is to maximize utility as defined by income, 
I understand it's quite logical, you know, the reasoning that you have. But if, for example, instead we think that equal rights are, you know, at the core of our theory of justice, then we can better understand why we are revolved by the GCC model and so on and so forth. And I think it's, it's something that, you know, is worth considering that, again, it's not just that justice is limited to equalizing incomes, which, you know, would be, and that's a fair assumption to make, but that equality of rights is maybe, you know, like Rose puts, that's a lexical priority, for example, in Rose's theory. And then we worry about, you know, uh, the uh, distribution part. So, so I, I have some sympathy for that view, but I also think that it, it would be a mistake to delude ourselves that you can really avoid these trade-offs in that way entirely. If you, so uh, Michael Clements has done some fascinating research uh, about what people expect to get when they move from the uh, India, Bangladesh to the GCC and what they in fact get. And people have A, extremely rational expectations, B, uh, I mean, almost a, almost frighteningly rational expectations. Uh, two, uh, they are they expect their quality of life and not just their income to increase. And in fact, according to every subjective evaluation, their quality of life does increase. Um, and uh, they do give up quite a lot of formal rights, but their chance of dying violently their chance of lots of other bad things uh, on a just biometric scale happening to them goes down dramatically. So, yeah, I mean, maybe we could say that, you know, in, in Congo, you have the absolute uh, equal right to be slaughtered by a, you know, roaming around band of, uh, you know, uh, uh, warlords. Whereas in the GCC, you have the very limited right, uh, you know, of freedom of expression. Uh, but it, for some reason, it just happens that you don't get slaughtered uh, quite as frequently. Uh, but I think that that's a pretty shallow and self-serving to our aesthetic sense way of thinking about what rights really mean. So, yeah, I mean. Can I add yeah, one yeah, thing? Yeah, yeah just an uh, interesting thing. I mean, when, even in Rawls's framework, I mean, there's a question of whether or not we should really treat certain types of rights as lexically prior. But then there's also two dimensions of rights, even in the Rawlsian thing. Mm -hmm. what rights people formally have and how secure they are. And of course, even the basic rights are a sort of heterogeneous group. So rights to physical integrity and are certainly part of basic rights, which are normally thought to constrain. Um, and they can be more or less secure regardless of how sort of formally they're granted or not. So you'd probably get these same answers. Uh, yeah. uh, go back to the issue of uh, the, there's, Global, any kind of social, uh, social welfare funds with any sort of egalitarianism, then globally, the optimal taxation will be for a lot of transfers, which aren't occurring, yeah. uh, and probably will occur. So as we just take it as a constraint, uh, the, the selfishness of the wealthy rich, right? The, the, you just take that as a constraint. <laughs> so then, then what, what can be done within that constraint? So I, mean, just, I, think, I think they're, you know, they're, they're uh, I mean, just, just to throw out toy options here. I mean, one thing is, uh, uh, there might be some interest, some cases where the interests of the wealthy may coincide with the interests of the global poor. So, just in a toy example, the the wealthy care about climate, you know, global warming, and, and so they're they're willing to put in uh, a suite of uh, uh, nuclear powered uh, <coughs> energy plants, uh, power plants in uh, you know China and India and Southeast Asia. In return for guarantees about you know no coal production or lowered coal production, uh, so it, so the, so the so that isn't just an altruism. It's a, there's a there's a payoff. You know. Another another kind of case would be you could leverage the fact that if you think it's a fact that wealthy wealthy selfish people have some nice values. So if they have to maintain large military establishments just for their own interests, you could leverage that. You could, for instance, say uh, uh, encourage uh, you know demands on. Uh, 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 other countries you know, don't do things that are involve ethnic cleansing, or else we'll go after you. Don't you know? If, if let women go to school. You know, increase your rates of women going to school, or we'll or we'll use our military and might against you. If, if you make the threats realistic, that can be very cheap. You know, it, it does, doesn't doesn't it, it doesn't affect the material interests of the welfare. And, and if you do this, you might think, well, you're going to have to keep 
beating up on people coercively. But if you do this sensibly, if you think about it, it can be self-sustaining. Once the women are educated, they'll take care of themselves. If you've got a country with a horrible you know, racial <laughs> underclass or overclass, if you force them to, to, so that the, the racial underclass gets some material power, they'll take care of themselves after that. I mean, think, for instance, in hypothetical terms. It wasn't a given in America that radical reconstruction after the Civil War would, would fail. There's a possible future history of America in the 1870s and 1880s where blacks get empowered. So just imagine there'd been some, I don't know, Mars or Europe or somewhere threatens credibly the United States, you know, you know, uh, you know don't, don't disempower the blacks or else. That, then you just get, you know, once the blacks are empowered and they've got material wealth and they've got voting rights and stuff, they can take care of themselves after that. So I mean, again, these are just toy examples. I mean, another, another toy example would be I mean, the big thing for material inequality and for, for, for inequality and for affluence globally is surely raising the you know, economic development in, in mm -hmm. poor countries. So what can be done to foster economic development in China and India and other places, you know, Africa, I suppose, uh, you know, that's not against the material interest of the welfare? So it seems to me that there can be a lot of things that I, might be done, except, you know, thinking optimal taxation is first, if that's constrained by the selfishness of the wealthy, accept that constraint, but what else is possible? Uh, so I, I, I totally agree with the spirit of what you're saying. Uh, I think that's what I was trying to get at with these examples with migration, which I don't think would be costly. I think they would be beneficial yeah. to the wealthy. There, there's just two things I would say. One is that I think that the so examples... Migration seems more nasty no, to no, me no, than well, well, I, forcing... I, 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 no, I, I, under, I understand that point, but I think that the things you're describing, they would have some impact. I think they're very, very small impacts relative to these. I mean, we could, we could argue about that, uh, uh, but I just think that they would be extremely small compared to this. I think, you know, they wouldn't be zero, but they would be a couple of order magnitudes smaller than, than this sort of thing. And the second thing I would say is that what you're raising, which I think is a really important issue, as the example I gave with Warren Buffett suggests, is there are many cases, I think, where the interests of the mm. truly wealthy coincide with the interests of the truly poor and against the interests of the global middle class or the less well-off within wealthy countries. And I think that raises really important issues for domestic public finance issues. Christian, do you want to ask? That's fine. It seems to me that there's another way of doing an optimal tax theory that would be informative. And yeah. that is to take account of the fact that perhaps 10% of the wealth comes to people from their exclusive access to natural opportunities, land. Uh, Somehow it doesn't surprise me that that's your question, Nick. <laughs> well, wouldn't you agree that in, a, uh, in an optimal taxation analysis that takes account of that, you'd collect all the rent from exclusive access to natural opportunities before you tax the return to working or saving? Yeah, so, so Nick's talking about like land and uh, natural resources and whatever. And I, I guess I uh, tend to be more skeptical than Nick of the ability of a land tax to be either coherently defined or to really produce an appropriate amount of revenue because I think it's very hard to disentangle what is actually owed to the land and what is owed to various forms of global public goods including technologies that people have come up with and, and things like this. So I, I personally don't see the strong attraction of that relative to the types of income taxes that we're talking about, but I, I do agree that anything that moves us in the direction of massively larger global redistribution, which that might, is something that I'm sympathetic to. But. Um, so I, uh, I also found this immensely stimulating uh, uh, pre present presentation. Um, I, I guess I wanted to ask, uh, I want to make one comment and then uh, ask a, a question. The comment is, first, I just wanted to say that, uh, as you indicated when you were considering what possible feasible policies there were, there are no feasible policies that get us to uh, the Qatar uh, place from here. I mean, for example, if you ask if the policy was supposed to be introduce virulent racism towards various ports, uh, places where there are the global poor, we, we already see what the effect of that is in the United States. There are political movements that embrace precisely those ideologies. Their conclusion is close the border, drive them out. That's not, not where this is all trending in the US now. And so, I mean, I, I don't, so, so that's, uh, 
sort of one one comment there. But now the the second the second but now the question I wanted to raise was just one about um, kind of the utilitarianism implicit in all this. And I don't want to be crude about this, but I mean maybe if I I'm going to be crude even though I don't want to and just sort of put it out there. So. So uh, suppose you thought that um, it was wrong to do various things, even if it would help out a lot of people. For example, suppose you thought it was wrong to murder somebody to save the lives of two other people. Um, and now, so now, you know, suppose you're, you took seriously your moral revulsion as involving, you know, sort of a, a lot of boundary lines, like suppose the proposition is enslaving people. Um, and suppose you think, well, you ought not to do that, even if it's going to help a bunch of other people out. Um, then, I mean, I think a lot of these arguments will become very problematic. Now, you might say, well, it'll help out those very people you're enslaving. But if it'll help out the very people you're enslaving because you failed in duties of justice to them in the first place, that, that doesn't make it permissible to enslave them on any scene. So I wonder if the kind of... But the, is, it, is it permissible to leave them in utter destitution, violence, and misery? Is that permissible? I mean, I don't see, I don't see you expressing that sort of. It's not permissible by saying you are under a duty, you are failing. Of course it's not permissible. Well, I, see, I just don't know what advocates of this sort of ideal intervention like think is the alternative feasible path. I mean, the, like imagine that, you know, Suppose that I, I believe in communist global revolution of some form, and I basically you know, think that the best scenario we could do is in the next couple of years, we establish a world government that institutes these sorts of transfers. Um, I don't think there's anyone in this room who, whatever feasibility constraints there may be in implementing something like the GCC model, I think it's hard to argue that it would be easier to do that sort of thing. And the amount of time in the transition path till we get to that sort of a world, if, if we were to have people here living on le in less destitution, we would both be likely to gain that sympathy for them more quickly. And in the interim, they would be much better off. I don't understand how we can just ignore the options available to us by pretending like we... But, but now this is the parallel. Yeah. I mean, how can you ignore that two people are going to die? if you don't murder this one person to save them. I'm, I mean... There's a, there's a big difference if, they're, if, they're, if you mentioned already in your first example, which is if, if they stand to benefit by your harmful agency, that's different than if they don't stand to benefit. So harming one to assist two others is different from engaging in, in conduct towards two that we find problematic but actually makes them better off relative to what they would be without that conduct. So I do think that you can't make that, yeah, that's, that's an important distinction. Now, I think that one, one question maybe you could pose like this is, if there is some antecedent duty to assist these people, and we're failing in that duty to assist and instead trying to extract benefits from their, their coming, then we're exploiting them, right? And that does seem to be wrong. Um, but if the, the, the difference, if as third parties, we're saying what would be better, because we know that they're not going to act on their duty to assist, should we f try to prevent them? from engaging in this program, even though the people who are coming, although we recognize it's not what they're, they're owed, they prefer it to the alternative or not, right? So, and similarly, if we think there's this duty to assist, then what's worse, them exploiting these people or us simply failing in our duties to assist without exploiting them? And I think part of the thrust here in this comparative assessment is to say, um, actually, you know, it's not obvious that exploiting someone who you have a duty to assist but aren't going to assist is any worse than simply not assisting them when you have a duty to assist. Um, I do think that's an interesting implication let, of this study. Let me give a personal version of this story. So I was living in a developing country with my wife and we, for various reasons, ended up having a maid. And we didn't want to let the maid do anything for us because uh, we felt uncomfortable, we thought it was in, in egalitarian, we thought we should cook our own breakfast, do our own laundry, etc. So we noticed that by the end of the first week, the maid was deeply depressed, she was uh, physically not looking very healthy, uh, and we were trying to figure out what was going on. So it turns out she had, uh, in a desperately poor part of that country, uh, children who were depending on her uh, pay to support their medical costs. Um, and she was eating the food that was the leftovers from the people that we took over the apartment from 
Uh, and the fact that we were not cooking anymore, uh, making her cook anymore, meant that she was losing calories. And she was incredibly afraid about her job, so she was saving her money and not sending it back to her children. So uh, I realized, I, I came to feel, and maybe I was wrong to come to feel, but I came to feel that I was being incredibly immature in my attitude of not exploiting her <laughs> effectively because it was, it was causing a terrible loss to a desperately poor and vulnerable person. And whatever revulsion I felt at the relationship we were in, I came to feel it was fundamentally an aesthetic revulsion and not a moral revulsion because if it were a moral revulsion, I would have been spending 60% of my income sending it to aid people like her. Okay, uh, so we have we have some further questions. I just wanted to yeah, yeah, exploit yeah. my own position uh, <laughs> yeah. to, uh, uh, to, to just uh, qu quickly note that you know this kind of tension that we this kind of you know the the, the tragedy you might say of these values being an intention mentioned at the, at the very end of the of the joint presentation. For your purposes, it's being treated as a kind of fixed constraint and you're trying to think about well what kinds of difficult judgments then do we need to make when we assume that kind of constraint but I take it neither of you are opposed to what political scientists who work on political and social movements over the last few hundred years would point out which is that obviously these uh, these values that uh, obviously place restrictions on how much wealthy and powerful are willing to give up certain amounts of their wealth and power uh, how much they're willing to give, their, uh, give up their, their wealth and power over time. That's been challenged by many movements in many places over time, and some of those challenges have been successful. So I take it that at least tacitly you're committed to making a set of judgments within these kinds of constraints, but then also presumably being in favor of the mobilization of publics over a long period of time, cross-generationally, to actually try to alter um, these values in such a way that the choices become at least somewhat less tragic over time. But do you want to say something about that? Or yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> all right. All right. Because I mean, I think some people might think, well, look, the the constraints are being taken just as kind of assumed to be kind of fixed over time, but they themselves are potentially in, in flux depending yeah. on. I guess my my view is that there's a hierarchy of constraints which each bind over different time horizons. And it is our moral obligation to, over every time horizon, optimize against the constraints that exist against that time horizon without unduly endangering the prospects of relaxing constraints over longer time horizons. But I think it would be a <coughs> terrible tragedy to allow our views about the longer time horizons to allow us to avoid the, con the optimizations we have to make in the shorter time horizons. And I think if we were to take that attitude, all of economics would go away because you could just say, well, there are no incentive constraints. Let's just teach people not to care about themselves, but to care about, you know, others. And then they'll want to be truthful to our mechanisms. I mean, it's, it's you know, that was the idea that, you know, the folks in uh, Russia had, and it didn't work out so great for them, so. But it, it is a kind of dual track view, though. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, okay, yes. Uh, this is for Glenn. Um, I found a... a an understandable, but a bit of a disconnect between the first half and the second half of your paper. Before you introduce mobility, you're using, uh, at, when you look at the national governments, you're looking at them optimizing in an optimal income tax framework. But when you deal, dealt with the migration, you weren't having them optimize. Um, and I can see for empirical tractability, you don't do that. But you know, there's an extensive and quite active literature on optimal income taxation with uh, migration. And I think it, it lends support to, they don't focus on inequality per se, but you can tease out some ideas. Um, and I think it supports what you're doing. Because once you open up the borders, um, you know, you've got to worry about losing uh, wealthy people. It becomes more dramatic when you deal with profit taxation. And so if you compare what the redistribution within a country is like in the closed economy versus the open economy, yes. um, there's less redistribution because of, of the mobility. And I think that just reinforces so that's that an excellent point. And in fact, one thing I didn't show, all those graphs I showed were contributions through migration to global inequality through receiving people. But if you include sending, 
actually even within the OECD there's a pretty strong negative relationship and the reason is exactly what you're describing and in fact I was thinking of using some of Stephanie's recent work to think about some of this stuff because places like Sweden and Canada that are more equal but are close to less equal places send a lot of their wealthiest people abroad and that undermines the value of their internal redistribution. So that's absolutely right. I too thought this was great. Oh I wanted to Start a trend by introducing myself because I think part of the reason we're here is to get to know each other. So I'm Matt Weinsroth, so everyone else do that. You know? <laughs> um, so I thought this was just wonderful. And what it made me think about is should we also extend, not that you haven't done enough work already, uh, the same thinking across time and not just across space, right? So it raises similar questions about trade offs between inequality today versus over the full time horizon. Similar questions of why one would restrict attention, restrict your attention to residents of today's world versus the future, and whether that's political or associative duties or whatever it is. And I think part of the problem there is that the economics of the trade off get a lot tougher. And so that makes me think about one observation on the GCC, which is that it seems to me like the potential gains of getting people to move to the OECD depend on the fact that the OECD is like a really robust institutional market economy structure. And GCC is robust, but it's robust because they all have oil. I mean, that's the one elephant in the room. And so I worry a bit that we can't quite, that the stability in the, in the GCC may be dependent on the oil, and that's why they can support such large migratory populations and keep a lid on things. And so if we try to do the same thing with the OECD, would that sort of very positive political economy institutional structure that we have no longer be supported? And then would the cost to future generations in terms of welfare be quite high? I think that's a fascinating question. I think it's like the leading response in my mind to like the desirability of the GCC model. However, I'm not that confident. My, my basic judgment after reflecting on this has been that I don't think it's really the case that it's impossible to have a vibrant liberal society with a giant group of slaves uh, living underneath it. Uh, if you just think of places like, for example, uh, South Africa, Israel, uh, uh, the, you know, Rome, Greece, there have been a lot of societies that have been extremely open, maybe even more liberal than, uh, than the societies that we live in, and that have a huge number of people living in destitution very close by. And somehow, you might think, well, you need a giant, you know, repressive apparatus that will repress freedom of speech and, you know, suppress creativity. Doesn't seem to stop a lot of startups in Israel, and it doesn't seem to have stopped a pretty flourishing society in white South Africa. So, maybe, but, but I, I would like some more evidence before I'm convinced that there's really a trade-off there. Okay, we only have a couple of minutes, so I'm wondering if we can collect a couple of two or three questions now, just so they're out on the table, and then maybe if there's a little bit of time to say something about them uh, before we uh, head into our break. Wondering, so Danny, I'm Danny Yagan. Uh, I'm wondering if you have You, you could also say whether they're an economist and where they're from, that would be good. <laughs> or uh, where, where, what field they're from and where they're from. Danny Yagan from the University of California, Berkeley, and I'm on the economics team. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering uh, if, if you have thoughts on how to anchor people's true preferences uh, for being born into different societies. So my parents are immigrants from a country with about $10,000 of GDP per capita in purchasing power parity. We have about $50,000. I think they and our extended family might prefer a 50-50 bet between being here with $60,000 and there with $20,000 rather than sure bet of $40,000 in each place. If that's true, then it dramatically would change how we would feel about you know, whether we should be doing a lot of international redistribution rather than focusing on international. How do we elicit those preferences? Um, so I wanted to follow up actually on, on Ben's question. So I'm uh, Nathan Hendren, uh, economist at uh, Harvard. And so um, I share kind of the general repulsion to racist tax policy, which I think you gave a really nice uh, argument for how it can generate a Pareto improvement. And throughout, you're very careful from an incentive constraint perspective. But in some sense, um, you're allowing free choice of norms. 
Um, so you say, okay, well, let's, let's allow us to sort of change our societal norms so that we'll be more uh, repressive towards one group and that can make that group actually better off. What I'm wondering is if, um, should we be worried if that because we can't model the underlying repulsion that we're generating, that we're finding instances where we could get these Pareto improvements and so the, you know, removing the repulsion would be good, but maybe that's some part of some kind of broader constraint. So for example, if we institute uh, a, a racist uh, tax policy, I'm, I'm you know, calling it racist, a, a tagged tax policy towards migrants. Um, do we think that would lead to other types of settings because it would change the moral setting where we would then have exploitative relationships that would no longer be Pareto improving to that group? So is the, are we allowed to freely choose this alternative particular tax policy that tags without letting that also come along with all the other crazy Tea Party stuff that could come? With, with potentially, you know, you, know, you get the gist. I'm David Weisbach. I'm neither an economist nor a philosopher. I'm a, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I was going to ask you about uh, Joel Stumrod's paper, where he sort of takes the opposite approach to the one you take, where he sort of takes our, our policy and backs out uh, uh, welfare weights, and it's with very, very low, low welfare weights on the poor. It kind of reminds me of what's going on now with, say, Matt's work or, or Stan Chavis' work. And I wonder how you decide, well, what's the right approach? Why take the top-down approach rather than so some of us backing out approach. Yes, uh, I'm Florian Scheuer, also an economist uh, at Stanford. Um, it has been raised a couple of times a little bit, but I wanted to uh, push this notion a little bit more that redistribution, at least in democracies, is really the outcome of a political process between different groups, the rich and the poor, and they vote about how much redistribution there will be, and if we think that democracy is a good model uh, to generate equilibrium redistribution, whether the question doesn't become uh, whether we should have more transfer transfers across countries or more migration. But you know, the problem is that if the rich countries they vote about how much redistribution they want to do for, towards the poorer countries, then the question, the problem is that you know the receivers don't have voting power. Uh, about how much transfers they're going to get. And so then the really sort of moral problem becomes, shouldn't we give more voting power to the poor countries so that they, so that we sort of have a global democracy where everybody votes about global redistribution? And you can see that even within very rich countries, if you think of the European Union and cross-country transfers, how hard it is to get even among these relatively rich countries to get political agreement for a little bit of redistribution from Germany to Greece, countries like that, if you have voting at the national level, it's so hard to get this implemented. And this also raises then these sort of dynamic questions that Matt opened up, which is, you know, if we also think about redistribution across generations, some of them aren't born yet, that is a big problem because the unborn generations don't have voting power. So. I, I was just asking whether you know this, this sort of moral problem isn't one of how much political power to give to Britain. Chris, you want to take 30 seconds? So I'll take 30 seconds to respond to any of those. You, yeah, take, sure. a, you can take a couple. We started a few minutes late, okay, so sure. if you want, you can spend a, a little bit of time. Yeah, if I understood Nathaniel's uh, question, was, in a way, it's the, the reverse of the thing we were thinking about, which is this issue of how you act now, the effect it'll have on future constraints. And it's sort of in reverse, right? So that if you're thinking about whether or not it's desirable to introduce a model, you don't want to think about just whether or not it's going to optimize now, but is it going to somehow, I mean, it's a weird kind of constraint, but uh, you know, relax the constraints in the wrong kind of way for other sorts of future behaviors, right? And um, I, w I won't speak for good on that, but I think obviously you have to be alive to those effects, right? Just as in the case of saying whether or not, even though it would optimize, um, I even though it would be a, a welfare gain, to the, the exploited person here, there can be reasons not to exploit because it may have effects on my future dispositions, it may have effects on others, it may have incentive effects, and it may undermine general norms against this sort of thing, which would be, right? So obviously, and I don't take either of us as advocating the Gulf model as such, or at least I, I certainly don't, but yeah. Uh, so on Danny and Nathan's points, I think my basic answer would be like, oh, we need a lot more research. Like, I, I, I don't. I don't have clear, crisp answers to all of these things. I think that if we take the standard public finance approach, we get some very stark results, which matter massively more than most of the things we usually worry about in public finance. So yeah, we should think a lot more about this stuff. And I, I don't have the answer immediately. I think you can give some pretty 
more immediate short-term answers to questions like, you know, the proposals for immigration, you know, from Mexico to the United States and very narrow things like that. But if you're talking about one of these big things, I mean, that, that's a massive radical thing that needs thousands of papers written about it. So I, I don't really have anything to say about that. Um, in response to David's point, uh, we did do that actually learned about Joel and uh, Wojciech's paper uh, like right when I was finishing this up and found out that they got exactly the same numbers we got somehow. Uh, so that was comforting, but I, you know, I, I wasn't going on the basis of their paper and thinking why you know, do something different. They actually did this exercise and the reverse exercise. They did both, so, and, and, I, and I like both. So. Uh, and finally, on Florian's point, like, yes, I favor world government. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what to say. I don't think that that's like you know. I think that that's much more pie in the sky than than the things that I was talking about, as pie in the sky as those are. But yes, look, I'm very sympathetic to that. So. Okay, I think we should. Uh...